Well, it's been a whirlwind kind of month for Kathleen Wynne. Four weeks ago tomorrow, she won the Ontario Liberal leadership in an exciting three-ballot convention victory. Eleven days ago, she and her cabinet were sworn into office. Four days ago, her government's first speech from the throne. Two days ago, her first question period. And soon, her first budget. Lots to discuss, so let's get to it. Here is the 25th Premier of the province of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne. Welcome to TVO. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Last time we spoke was just after your convention victory. A little bit's happened since then. Yeah, so we do want to get caught up, and we thank you for making this uh, a place for, for, I think, your first sit-down interview since it, you became Premier. It is. Okay. I want to just take you back a week and a half to when you had your hand on the Bible and you were taking your oath of office. Twenty-five people in 145 years have had a chance to do that. So I'm just nerdy enough to want to know what that moment was like. Intense and emotional. You know, um, the and humbling. I mean, the just being in that place every day is uh, is a humbling experience. But um, to be there with uh, with my family, with people who have people who have played that role, you know, because there were former premiers in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, and to, to realize the weight of the responsibility. I think that was, you know, I don't think you fully realize it. I'm, I'm getting that as the, the days go on. But that was the, the moment of, okay, this is, this is real. This is really going to happen. Because the convention and the campaign, I've experienced campaigns before. I've been at conventions before. I haven't been in the convention in, in, as, a, as a candidate, but, um, but I've experienced those political moments before. But the swearing in really, it felt like it was the beginning of the, the big responsibility. I've talked to previous premiers about this who have said that when that moment passes, they actually feel the weight on mm -hmm. their shoulders. Exactly. Do you, did you actually feel that? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a, a sort of, um, I don't know if weight, but yes, I think that's probably a good way of describing it. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the responsibility that then settles on your body, you know, and your mind, that uh, you really have to do this in the best way possible. Uh, Barack Obama used Abraham Lincoln's Bible. I noticed you used a Bible. Anything special about that it's Bible? my father's Bible. It was? Yes, yeah, it was from when he was a, a young man, actually. He always inscribes his books, and it was uh, 1954. He had, I don't know what the occasion was, but he, uh, he had that Bible since 1954. Some a year us, after I was born. Oh, okay. So. I was going to say, happy 60th birthday soon. Uh, yeah, soon. Not, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> soon, right. Yeah. Uh, some of us were a little surprised, actually, that you had a Bible there. Because, you know, you have the option of not using a Bible and just mm -hmm. sort of affirming your oath as opposed to swearing to God an oath. Mm -hmm. Which made me wonder, are you a religious person? I'm a, I've been a member of the United Church of Canada my whole life. And, you know, I was a member of the... Canadian Girls in Training, the CGIT. My grandmother and uh, grandfather uh, were church going. My, my grandmother was very much part of the United Church Women. So it's, it's actually been very much a part of, of my life. Um, and I, I wouldn't say I'm a religious person. We always talked about, you know, religion, spirit. spiritual. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, uh, I believe in organized religion as a community cultural reality, you know, and I raised my kids in the United Church so that they would have a choice, basically, so they'd, they'd know where I came from, and uh, it's, it's important to me in that cultural sense. Gotcha. Okay, speech from the throne earlier this week. Speeches from the throne are usually, you know what they say, a sort of a vague laundry list of here's all the stuff we want to get done, and I know some of the feedback I got from viewers on Twitter and email and online and so on was, okay, we get all that, but like, what are the three things she actually wants to do? So what are the three things you actually want to do? Well, I, you know, I think it, I think it, uh, there are three things that I can clearly articulate and were articulated in the, in the throne speech. Uh, we talked about jobs and growing the economy. So whether that's youth unemployment, uh, so helping young people to find co-op placements, internships, uh, opportunities to, uh, to explore different, uh, different career paths, or whether it's supporting small business uh, through making sure they have access to capital. All of those are job creation strategies, and you've heard me talk many times about infrastructure, mm -hmm. making sure that we have the right infrastructure in place. So I want, I want to focus on those job creation strategies. Um, I also want to, uh, I talk about fair society, you know, I want to make sure that we do the work that, for example, 
example, Munir Sheikh and Francis Lankin have laid out for us. The social assistance system needs a lot of work. It, there's untangling that needs to happen there. Are you committing and, to all of their recommendations? Well, no, what I'm saying is that we need to begin to implement their recommendations. And one of the things that uh, I think there's all party agreement on, but certainly the NDP and uh, Liberals agree, is that um, people with disabilities who are working need to be able to keep more of their money. You know, the, the clawback that happens is, I think, unfair and, in fact, doesn't allow them to, uh, to get ahead. So those are, those are things that I want to work on very concretely. And then the third part is the tone and the getting along. And, you know, that, that may be the most challenging of all because um, there are lots of, uh, lots of differences among the, the parties in the legislature. But for me, the collaborative style and that model goes beyond just the legislature. It's about urban and rural. It's about making sure that we do establish and re-establish respectful relationships with, uh, with our employee groups. So beginning with teachers, but beyond that, those respectful collaborative processes need to be in place. So for me, that's not just an add-on, Steve. The way we do politics, the way we do government, is almost as important as what we do. Well, let me, let me go for one hard and fast example here then. I appreciate that you're trying to reach out to the teacher mm -hmm. groups and to try and get them yeah. uh, to a better place in your relationship where they can start doing extracurriculars again, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Talking to Ken Coran from the OSSTF after your throne speech in which he said, on a scale of one to 10, my teachers are at about a 12 when it comes to their anger level right, right. now, and it won't be reduced until she, meaning you, goes beyond tone which mm -hmm. he appreciated, mm -hmm. but almost signs in blood the notion that what happened in Bill 115 will never be done to us again. Can you do that? Well, what I can, what I can say is that my commitment to collective bargaining is real, and it's exactly the conversation that we're having with the leadership right now. I, I want us to come to agreements through a collective bargaining process. I want there to be a provincial process, and I want there to be a local process. And so I know that that's what teachers want. The, the process that we've uh, undergone in the last year and a bit has not been a good one. And I've been clear about that for a long time now. And so that's why we're having a conversation with the leadership. And I, I believe that there are concrete things that we can work on without preempting the conversations that are going on. I believe there are concrete things that we can work on. And one of those is what's the process going to look like going forward? Okay. And you, of course, you know, Tim Hudak has already said he's not going to support the throne speech. He's going to try and bring the government down. Andrea Horvath seems more open-minded right now about keeping you guys alive for a little longer. My question is, will you inevitably, she's obviously the, the, the partner in peace, I guess, going forward. Does that inevitably mean that you're going to have to tack somewhat left to find areas of common interest so that she will vote for or at least not bring you guys down? Well, you know, this question, this question comes up a lot. And I, uh, one of the things that I think is important is that Tim Hudak represents a constituency. And I don't mean his riding. I mean a constituency in the province that is, you know, is very focused on fiscal responsibility and wants to make sure that the government is going to pay attention to the bottom line. I'm not going to abandon that constituency because Tim Hudak doesn't want to work with but me in the But you won't be as house. austere as he wants you to well, be. I won't be as austere as he wants him to be anyway. You know, even if he did want to work with me, we would have to find common ground. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to acquiesce to everything that Andrea Horvath wants us to do either. But what I am going to try to do, and I will continue to work out, to, reach out to Tim Hudak, you know. He said he doesn't want to work on the throne speech with us. Well, fair enough. But I'm still going to include him in a conversation about how do we now get to a budget. If he doesn't want to talk to me, Steve, then that's his prerogative. But I am going to be reaching out to him. But in my conversations with Andrea and with Tim, I hope we'll be able to work on those issues that where we can find uh, a common interest, you know, and I think there are a number of them. I believe there are a number of them with Tim, but I certainly believe there are a number of them with Andrea. And I've, I've identified some of them, the youth unemployment, the, uh, the issue around the clawback on, uh, on social assistance. Those are things that she has put out as being of concern. I think they should be of concern to all of us. How about an end to the tax breaks for three martini lunches? She wants an end to that. Well, we're going. You know, um, Charles Souza, the finance minister, is already looking at those uh, those areas. I'm calling it uh, corporate tax compliance. You know, how, whatever you talk, whatever you call it, we're looking at that. Okay. Uh, auto insurance premiums minus 15 percent. She wants that. Right. And so the you know the conversation there, I think, has to be. Uh, we both want auto insurance premiums to come down. Mm -hmm. There is a an anti. 
uh, fraud task force report that is ready to be implemented. The, the, uh, the beginnings of that have, uh, have been put in place. I need, I need us to go forward on that, implement that, uh, that set of recommendations, and then look at the money that comes out of the system and make sure that those savings are passed on to the premium holders. Okay. Uh, beginning of the week started off not badly for you. Throne speech, pomp and circumstance, all of that stuff. Got a little tougher later in the week. Let's, have you seen this attack ad the Tories have run against you? I have assiduously not seen well, it, but I've heard about it. Well, sit back and relax, because we're going to show it to you now and then discuss. Lovely. Roll tape, please. The McGuinty Wind government's decision to cancel two gas plants is costing taxpayers $1.3 billion. Now that Kathleen Wynne is Premier, she says she was not in any meetings to cancel the gas plants. I was not part of any meetings uh, on the decision to move the gas plant. I w but newly released documents now show that Kathleen Wynne was at the cabinet table and was briefed on Project Vapor, the secret code name for the cancellation. Did she choose to forget she was part of it? It's extremely important for governments, whatever stripe, to take responsibility for their actions. Premier Wynne, we couldn't agree more. Okay, this is all obviously about the Mississauga gas fire generating station, which was canceled in very close to election day in October 2011. And uh, as they've put the facts forward there, mm -hmm. Is there anything about that you want to clarify? Yeah. So the original decision, uh, when I when I said that I wasn't part of any decision to uh, move or close the gas plant, um, the original decision to move the the Mississauga plant, uh, I was not part of that decision. And and you know the reality is I was part of the campaign team, but the room where that decision was made was not one that I was in. So that's the point I was making there. And yes, I'm part of, I was part of the cabinet. And once the decision had been made, which had been a political decision, then the, the fallout from that and the, you know, the, uh, the uh, costs associated with that, I was part of cabinet and we had to follow through on those. But the point I was making was that the political decision to move the gas plant, I was not part of. But let me just say this, that um, all of the parties in the legislature agreed that those gas plants should not be placed where they were. And so my regret in this, Steve, is that the original decision wasn't made earlier. You know, that, that we didn't cite those gas plants in a better way from the beginning. And through the leadership, what I talked about was better community process, better process for citing infrastructure, energy infrastructure in particular, because it's not just gas plants that are an issue. You know, there are windmill, there are wind turbine issues in the province where communities have said the process hasn't been right. So, you know, what I said before about process can be as important as substance. These are great examples of where process has really undermined uh, policy, has undermined progress. Okay, let me ask you another process question. You wanted to take one approach to putting a little sunshine all this, opening it up, accountability, transparency, etc. The opposition had some different ideas and they decided earlier this week that they wanted to reconstitute these legislative committees that are going to look into contempt proceedings against the guy who used to have the job, Chris Bentley, who's actually not in politics anymore. He's left. What do you think about that idea? Well, they made a decision. Uh, they made two decisions. They made a decision to go ahead with the contempt motion, as you say, against a member who's not in the legislature any longer. And they made a decision to go with a, a standing committee and to take that contempt motion to the standing committee, rather than to establish a different committee called the Select Committee, which would also be an all-party committee, and would, uh, would take a different tax. So they made that decision, Steve. I'm disappointed. I think that uh, the, the contempt motion at this point really is mean-spirited and really doesn't have much to do, in my opinion, with getting to the bottom of the issue, which I agree. We need to make sure that all the information is available. We need to make sure that whoever's searching for information, and the OPA made an announcement today that there are more documents, we need to make sure that all the documents are available to the committee, that the committee can ask the questions that it needs to ask. For me, that's the shared interest in all of this. and. Uh, uh, they've made a they've made a different decision, and as I say, I'm I'm disappointed at that. But that is the decision they made. Uh, the 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 Ontario Power Authority has come up with more documents because they've done more searches, and they went through a pretty tough press conference uh, right. Thursday afternoon. And uh, my question for you is: Are you going to fire anybody over there? Governments fall over this kind of thing. So you know, I uh, I listened to the uh, part of the press conference that uh, that they did yesterday, and I will have an opportunity to uh, speak with the Minister of Energy about that. Um, the reality is that the committee asked for 
certain information. And so it's been an ongoing process that that information has been, uh, has been sought and revealed. And I'm, you know, I would have much preferred that all the information be available at one point. But uh, the reality is that it's a complex process and they continue to, uh, they continue to find documents that, um, because as I said in the House, it's not just a, s a set of boxes that are sitting with papers in them. You know, this well, is electronic, it. computer this is electronic information, it's computer searches, so, um, so those questions are being asked of the data and they are getting documentation back. I, you know, I can't tell you what's going to happen going forward. What I know is that I'm committed to getting all the information out that, uh, that we can and to provide that information to the committee. I've also said that I will appear before the committee. I've asked the Auditor General to look at both the Mississauga and the Oakville decisions. So I'm doing everything I can to uh, provide the information that both the opposition and the, the public need. I'm going to ask you a little smart-ass follow-up here, okay? okay? The last Liberal leader who took over from a three-term victor was Paul Martin over Jean Chrétien. And Paul Martin came in and he had this Gomery inquiry, you know, that he called, looking at the sponsorship scandal, because he said, we're going to open up, you know, lots of sunshine's the best disinfectant, we're going to let all the, let a thousand flowers bloom, and uh, that turned out to be, he got killed in that. He got killed, and he didn't have anything to do with it. Now, most people I've talked to say, you didn't have anything to do with this decision, you've told us today you didn't have anything to do with this decision, but aren't you worried about that? That's a precedent. Well, you know, Sitting where I'm sitting right now, uh, really there's only one option for me, and that is to take responsibility for decisions that were made by our government, because I'm, I'm not under any illusion that I, uh, I can say, well, that was, that was another government that did, did all that, you know? I was part of the government, and I take responsibility for that. But what we have to understand right now is that the interest, I think, that underlies all the questions that are coming forward, all the questions, impassioned as they are in question period, is tell us what happened. Give us the information. That's the interest at the base of this. So I am trying to meet that interest. I'm trying to provide the information that is being asked for by the committee, by the opposition. Really, I don't believe there's any choice for me. And, and I, don't, I wouldn't want there to be a choice. You know, I'm, I'm happy to take responsibility, and I, I want people to understand what went on. And I want us to have a clear understanding of exactly what went on. Okay, well, uh, I hear you, but everybody seems to have a pretty good understanding of what went on. The Premier and the campaign director made a decision in the dying days of a campaign to cancel this thing for political reasons to save Liberal seats. Right? Right. And I, but I believe that the opposition... Uh, has some idea that there's more information, there's something else to find out. And all I want to do is make sure that they have all the, they have all the documentation and we answer their questions. That is my, that is my objective. Okay. Let's, um, I want to talk about your cabinet a bit. Mm -hmm. You swore in a new cabinet a week and a half ago and Charles Sousa is the new finance minister. And I wonder whether, I mean, in, I'm sure it came up at some point in your discussions with your advisors as to whether or not to give him that job. Given that, his was one of the seats that was saved, apparently, by the cancellation of this gas plant. And I know he was against it from the get-go. He was always against this, mm -hmm. uh, citing that plant there. But he's the finance minister who may have to find more than a billion dollars in the budget in order to pay off these people who you broke the contract with. Any complications in that? I, you know, I, I need people in my cabinet who can do the jobs. And uh, Charles, has a, Charles has a really good background for being a, a finance minister, having been in the banking industry, understanding how finances work. He and I agree on a lot, but we don't agree on everything, and that's a really good thing. So I want him, I want him sitting beside me as we go into, uh, into this budget. And I got to know him better during the leadership campaign, I have to say. And, uh, you know, I think that I think we really can work together. He listens. He's thoughtful. He's, uh, he's consultative and collaborative and so those are those are attributes that I think are very necessary in all of our uh, ministers but particularly in the finance minister right now because he's got to listen to everybody around the table uh, he needs to hear what's going on in their ministries and he needs to hear what's going on in our communities from all of our caucus so that we can put together a budget that uh, meets the needs of the people of the province okay here's an odd follow-up because I want to ask about somebody who's actually not in the cabinet right. you know where I'm going here I want to see if I can get a better understanding or clarification of what happened in the days after you won the convention before you got sworn in with your cabinet as it relates to who came second. Yeah. 
Did you or any representatives of you talk with Sandra Pupatello or any of her representatives about her potentially coming back into public life, joining the cabinet, running in a by-election, that kind of stuff? I had three conversations with Sandra directly, uh, two on the phone and one uh, long one in person. And uh, basically, I said to her, Sandra, what do you want to do? Because I am open to you being part of my uh, government, part of my, uh, my uh, going forward in any way that you want to be, whether it's with the party or whether it's uh, in government, whether it's running in a by-election. So really, they were open-ended conversations. And honestly, she wants to do other things. You know, she is interested in doing other things. There were people who were neither my agents nor my staff, nor my volunteers, who had other ideas and thought that, you know, I should make a decision for Sandra or Sandra should make a decision that she wasn't ready to make, you know, and there were people talking about whether I should appoint her to be my finance minister or she should run in the by-election. Really? Sandra needed to make those decisions herself. And I, I know that if I pick up the phone tomorrow and I say to Sandra, I really need you to help us out in this area, I know she would be there. She's given years to the party. Mm -hmm. And she's been a terrific, terrific member and minister. And she deserves the right to decide what she wants to do. As I look at your cabinet, Premier, Deputy Premier, Health Minister, Education Minister are all women. In other words, Chair of Cabinet. And chair of cabinet. Okay, so five of the top six jobs. Was that a deliberate choice on your part? Uh, those choices were made based on who I believe can do the job the best. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, if I were a man and all those positions were held by men, I don't think you'd ask that question. Well, I'm asking it, obviously, because it's historic. Yes. It's never been done yes, before. exactly. So I'm interested in history. And, that's, and that, is, that is very true, and I chose people on their merits. And gender had nothing to do with it. I mean, I'm just saying because that's a statement you might want to make. You guys don't win elections unless you bring the, the quote unquote, the female vote home, which has been migrating away yeah, in the last little yeah. while. Well, you know, I certainly, I certainly paid attention to gender balance and having, uh, having women in cabinet, which Premier McGinty did too, to be fair. He had a very, he had a very uh, strong representation of women in cabinet in important portfolios. Nobody has promoted women like you have. Well, <laughs> I don't know well, if you meant to, but I'm just saying it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't think it should be a huge surprise that I believe that there are very strong, capable women, and I want them in, I want them in decision-making roles. I want them to be influential because I want the best people to be influential. So I made decisions in cabinet on merit. And I said, you know, I said during the uh, leadership campaign when s people would ask me is Ontario, is it time for a, a woman to be premier? Uh, you know, it's about the merit and it's time for the person who is qualified and who is going to be able to lead to be premier. Okay, in our remaining moments here, I wanna just finally talk about making minority parliament work. Right. This legislature was elected 16 months ago. Do you have a view as to how long it should last? Well, I'm thinking October 2014 would be a good good date. Would How you about like October to see it, 2015? Would you like to see it all the way through to well, the end, if you possible? Know, I'd like to see it through to the end. I would. I think that would be terrific, and I think it would be a testament to uh, the members' abilities to work together. And so I'm. I've got my sight set on the next two years, three years, you know, to uh, to try to make it work. And I'm I'm going to do everything in my power to uh, to do that, Steve. That's why that's why the throne speech was crafted the way it was. That's why I spent time meeting with the members of the opposition, listening to people from across the floor, trying to find that common ground, and then putting those uh, putting those notions in the throne speech. And uh, I'm going to do the same going into the budget. That doesn't mean it's not a liberal government. It doesn't mean it's not a liberal throne speech or a liberal budget. It means that because of, and I think we're in a, in a perfect position occupying that middle ground, we can find common cause with, uh, with both sides of the political spectrum. So, uh, so I, uh, you know, I'm going to do my best to get there. The reason I ask is because, uh, although there's absolutely no constitutional obligation on your part to do so, most new premiers, incoming premiers, who sort of inherit the job from mm -hmm. somebody in their own party, um, have a view that there's a sweet spot uh, I can govern for X number of months, but at some point I kind of need to have a grand consultation mm -hmm. with the public uh, and have my own mandate. And that usually comes before the term is out. So I hear you saying... And it, you're, and it, you're, may, it, it may very well. You know, do you I, know when that sweet spot is? 
No, I don't. I don't. And that's what I was going to say. You and I know that a week in politics is, is an eternity. Yeah. So who knows what's going to happen next week? But I think my mindset has to be that our government is here to govern. We have a, a lot of issues on our, our, our plate. You know, I, I just did a... Um, a uh, conference call with uh, with some of the uh, rural and agricultural stakeholders in in the province yesterday, and you know there was a lot of talk about the needs of rural Ontario and the needs of the agri food industry. I mean that's just one example, and I raise it because I'm also the agriculture food minister. But it doesn't matter whether you talk about education or infrastructure. Glenn Murray, the minister of transportation, is talking about how we're going to find the right revenue streams to build transit. There are huge issues confronting us. Those are the things that I want us to be talking about and so I need to set my sights on a time frame that's going to allow us to get some of that work done and that's not going to happen in three months or four months I need a longer time than that that's what I'm going to try to do if it doesn't work out then we'll go to the people and we'll get it we'll uh, we'll get our mandate from the people I could imagine though a scenario whereby let's say in six months time your poll numbers start looking better and you just say let's go to the lieutenant governor and get it done is if, that possible it, it anything's possible but the reality is that if I believe that we are getting work done and we're getting it done in a way that meets the needs of the people, then I'm not going to go into an election because people don't want frivolous elections and they don't care. The people of Ontario don't really care about my political career or the political career of my members. But the people in your party do. Well, and they, they do. will they will hold it against you for the rest of your life if you don't strike when the iron is hot. Well, I will just have to bear that, won't I? Because <laughs> if I believe that our government is able to govern and we are doing the work that needs to be done in the province, then I think it's my responsibility to continue governing. Okay, except Ernie Eves said the dumbest mistake he ever made was not going right away because well, he was never more popular <laughs> than when he first got the job. Well, you know, that, what may, it's worth. that may be, and I, uh, you know, Ernie and I at some point will have a conversation about that. <laughs> okay, last thing. Before you got this job, you may have had some notion, watching Dalton McGinty do it, obviously, for nine years, about what it's actually all about. Mm -hmm. Now that you actually have it, how does your impression of what it was compare with, admittedly, two weeks into it, the reality of doing it? Well, I think I, having been at the having been at the legislature for nine years, having been as an MPP for nine years, I think I had a pretty good idea, good idea of the issues that I was uh, going to be confronting. The you know one of the exciting things about it is that I can bring my own stamp to how we interact and how caucus works and and how we uh, how we uh, relate to each other in cabinet. Um, I think that some of the some of the personal constraints I don't think I was aware of. Such you know? as, such as well, we were talking about it earlier. When I go running in the morning, I have an OPP buddy now to go running with me, and that's not something I had thought about. And the, the change in my ability to be spontaneous in my life, to just decide that I'm going to, well, I'm not going to run at 6, I'm going to run at 6.30. Well, there's already a preordained time that I have set up. So spontaneity, which I realize now is a, a big part of who I am, it's more difficult to, uh, to have that in your life. Now, that may, sm that may sound like a small thing, but the reality is that um, many times it's those moments when I do my thinking, you know? It's, it's those moments when I get a bit of distance on, uh, on the work that I'm doing. So I have to figure out how to capture that within a, a more constrained life now. And I think people want their politicians to be able to think, you know? You, you want us to be able to have the, the kind of brain and soul food that we need to be able to make good decisions. So I have to figure that out now in my life as I have to figure out the time to see my grandchildren. I had a conversation with Bob Ray a couple of days ago about carving out time for family. And it, uh, it just, those are the realities that I'm not complaining in any way. It's a huge honor. But those are, those are realities that you don't see being, uh, being an MPP necessarily or being a member of the public. Can you drive anymore? I can't. You are not allowed to drive. I'm not allowed to drive. Why not? Well, it just, uh, it just, increases the risk of there being an accident or being an incident and uh, and the OPP have assessed that risk and they've decided that it is just better for premiers not to drive. You live in a city. I do. Can you walk to the corner and get a, car a carton of milk if you want to? If I let the OPP know that I'm going to do that. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you got a weird life. <laughs> uh, that's it's a privilege. So you say. Uh, Kathleen Wynn, thanks for uh, the first of what I hope will be many visits to our studio here pleasure. at TVO, and um, we thank you for making time for us tonight. My pleasure. Thanks. 
Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.